Thank you for joining Jennifer Shouts and Associates in our 2019 Webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and all recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can contact them directly for the contact information you'll see on the last slide. Just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal rating and also close to board compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. And this is an upcoming event that you can find more information here also on our website. And we do offer advertising, so you can email me if you would like more information on that. And our webinar today is sponsored by AccuTrack, and here is a short message from them. AccuTrack Consulting and Accounting Services is an 8A WOSB CPA firm committed to supporting entities sustain growth in government contracting. Our outstanding DCAA accounting solutions reduce audit risk, improve cash flows, and give you peace of mind. Contact us today to learn how we can enhance your DCAA accounting efforts. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Ed Salzberg, and he's going to be covering three tips for effective bid pipeline management. Thank you for joining us today, Ed, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, uh, Valerie, and thanks for having me on. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So I just finished a session in the la first half hour, and uh, they both, both of the sessions comes from the same training I did, and I'm not sure I got the titles right for each of them. Um, but, I, but I tried to simplify the um, capture and proposal management program for especially junior and mid-level staff. I work with a lot of senior folks as well, um, but most of them are pretty experienced. And I, while I think I do help them, I really can bring up junior and mid-level staff to a much higher level of performance in the capture program. Just think about the power of that if your mid-level staff are much more effective in their understanding how to execute an effective pipeline management and capture um, program. And so I've been, uh, I pulled uh, slides from a training that I've been doing for several years. Um, I think it's extremely effective. Customers tell me it's transformational. And I've found that especially mid-level staff will leave the training when I do it face-to-face, -face, uh, run down to their office and start to execute uh, some, of the, some of the principles that they've learned right in the training. Let's go to the next session, the next slide. Um, so the, the uh, training that I do is called uh, Win More Government Work and Spend Less Money Doing It. The idea is to uh, just to upgrade your capture management and your pipeline management program uh, based on hard analytics so that you can actually measure each, each aspect of your program. And I, use, I do more than just analytics, but I bring some insider tactics for winning government contracts based on uh, three concepts, uh, management, which is uh, the leadership, scaling, which is the analytics, and unified, which is common terms. And I, I call what I do common sense, but not always common knowledge, ways to beat the, the competition, because it, things need to be simplified, so it's very clear what to do to move from one stage of a capture program to the next. And I covered that in the previous um, the previous uh, webinar. So I just uh, ask you to go find that one if you didn't sit in on it, and uh, take a look at the the uh, pipeline management system that's in there, the, uh, pi the bid pipeline pyramid, uh, I think you'll, you'll just see a very simple way to communicate how to move from, from poorly or, or, or early stage um, opportunities and bring them up so that they are very well qualified leads where, where you've got a very, very high probability of winning. Okay, next slide. Um, so I've been doing this for a long time. I cut my teeth at SAIC uh, in the 70s and 80s into the 90s. I hate to say that I'm that old, um, but I still love doing this. Um, I, I, I love leading capture programs, uh, organizing proposals, leading red teams, um, but I, I really like doing the training because uh, I like working directly with the folks. So I, I was a partner at two small firms that we helped grow explosively, and I think that's where I really tested out some of the concepts here. I had a great time at Battelle leading the environmental sector, and since 2007, I've been working directly with government contractors to improve their win rates and just rationalize their programs um, overall. And what I found is that across the government contracting industry, very few firms or divisions grow explosively and that there's a difference from the, between the firms that do, like we experienced at SAIC and then at DynCorp and then at SRA and those that don't. Next slide. Um, 
I, I do a kind of a shorthand of the training where I pulled out um, 11 what I call Ed's essential elements for to grow government revenue. They really work for non-government revenue as well. And I'm just going to quickly run through these. These are 11 measures. These are 11 elements in which I have measures for, and I'm going to go through three of them here in this session. Um, the first one is the health measures. Those are the real analytics, and I covered those in the previous session, so I just ask that you go back and take a look at that recording. Um, and that's, and those, they measure the various aspects of the health of your pipeline and also the health of your contract backlog, and they really do go together. Uh, bidding frequency determines the number of bids needed to meet financial goals. The analytics actually apply where you can calculate how many bids and the, and the size of the bids in order to drive your business development program. Those analytics work if they're sitting on top of a, of a very defined, well-defined analytical uh, pipeline management and capture program. Pipeline quality ex separates meaningful bids from bids that are not meaningful. By meaningful, I mean that all of the questions that should be answered in the right order that they need to be answered are done, and so that there are not bids wavering around between um, between sections of your pipeline program. So prospects are different than leads. Leads are different than qualified leads. Qualified leads are different than well-qualified leads and your pipeline quality gets you to put the put your opportunities in the right stage um, so that when you add up those stages you're getting money you're getting total numbers that are really meaningful and representative of the quality of your pipeline bid pursuit information differentiates programs from business information i've got a slide on that one i believe i'm doing that i think i'm i'm doing that one in this in this uh, session the bid decision framework i did cover in the last training I don't the last hour I'm not going to do it here pipeline velocity is a way to keep leads from languishing on the bid list I don't touch that in this one but there's a really slick way to make sure that leads get uh, that capture that that opportunities get well qualified well before the RFP gets out uh, teaming sabotage I do talk about here uh, proposal readiness I believe I talk about here and red team scores um, I'm going to talk about here too. So if you just read through these and just sort of mentally check off if you think that you're doing each of these 11 things well. And then at the end, when I do the, when I cover three of them or four of them that I committed to, um, go back and rethink it and still if you see if you still think you're doing them well or not. Next slide. Um, I had mentioned in the in the in the uh, last half hour that there that that the 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 difference between the average firm and the real leaders in the business um, is that the the leaders in the business have a way to have short treads and steep risers. Um, all, all, all firms grow in a, in a step function. You win a contract and then you fill the contract up and that pops your revenue up. You may lose and go back. Let's not let's say that doesn't never happens. You always win your recompetes. Um, and then over time, you're going up and then over, up and then over. If your up is faster than your over, you've got a very healthy program. And so the industry leaders have a way of bidding more frequently and winning more often. And the tactics that I teach give, help you gain knowledge to get your organization on a much stronger growth path, the one on the top, the industry leader, rather than the one below it. Okay, next slide. And this is, Mallory, this one has a lot of, of, yeah, let's just pull all that stuff out and go right there. So essential element five, and remember there are 11, um, I talk about uh, bid pursuit information. So let's start from the left and I'll go to the right. Um, I do this training often and it, almost every time I do the training, somebody will ask me a question that I hadn't thought of before and that'll end up in a new addition to the training. So I, I was working with a company and did the training and a very senior person um, at, when I was talking about the the the, the um, competitive the information that you need in order that you need to go get um, to qualify the bids um, and and she said to me and this is a senior a senior officer in the company um, what question should I ask when marketing clients now, now if you're a very experienced business development person you, you you probably would come up with the same answer that I did but I turned that back to her and, and I asked her what she thought would be important to ask in a client meeting and she gave me the questions on the left what are your data gaps do you need a more rigorous risk assessment are you having web access issues 
our subject matter expert, what, what subject matter experts are you using? And while those are really good questions and they may lead to a task on a task order contract, they really focus on the client's program needs and not the, not, not their contract needs or not their business needs. And so the, inf the questions that I came back with, and you can clearly see the different how, difference, how are the incumbents doing? Do you currently view us as competitive? Are there must-have consultants or subs? What special capabilities must a prime have? Who are the thought leaders and decision makers in your company? So this leads to discussions that can help you position yourself from the contract, for the contract. And I just found that many technical staff don't necessarily know the difference without it having them pointed out to them. Program meetings, program information on the left, competitive information for business meetings on the right, and some are not comfortable asking the competitive questions and often need help getting past that reluctance, which is why I, I like to focus on uh, mid-career professionals to get them from the left um, to the right. So on the check on that checkbox, now I don't know if you were able to download the slides or not, but just think about that. Put a check down if your company guides staff on how to use competitive information. Many firms don't, they just assume. Um, and I'd like to kind of come in and test that theory and um, uh, provide some training when necessary. Okay, next slide. Okay, this one I love. Um, essential element eight, teaming sabotage, keeping teaming decisions from sabotaging the bid. Teaming done too early, look at the left side of the screen, runs the risk of locking in the wrong subcontractors and done too late, might lose the right ones. Teaming is an art, not a science, and there's no single way to do this right. Actually, in most of the elements that I train on, there's no universal answer to the question. But a discussion about that question is so appropriate, and having experienced people in the room with in that discussion does lead you down a series of activities that get you to the right answer. Teaming must be a constant topic in all bid review meetings. It really is in my experience. And capture team meetings. When management can't think of more questions to ask about which firms should be pursued, then it's time to start thinking about finalizing the teaming. A good way to guide the teaming decision is to develop a theory of the team, which is a brief statement of the rationale for each subcontractor slot, not each subcontractor, but each slot, which starts with understanding the competitive nature of the bid, a concept I've talked about in the, in the, in the last webinar, and then moves toward the weaknesses that your organization has that needs to be filled by subcontracting um, in order for you to be on the playing field um, for that opportunity. Good reasons for including a slot are things like the need for more client relationships, special skills or tools, added depth and other differentiators. And it's important precept important standard to only add subcontractors that fit into the theory of, or you weaken the bid rationale and you, you may really confuse the evaluators. So, um, you know, very often, and I've been on the evaluation side as well as on the proposal development side, very often the, the reason why the team is put together is not really clear. Um, so the evaluators are confused about what those firms are doing there. Um, are they tripping over each other? Um, are, are, they, are there any commitments to firms that they don't see as necessary? So not putting the time in to think through the theory of the team and to answer all of the questions necessary to define those slots and then find the right firm for those slots, um, it's really important to run through that exercise. And as I said earlier, I, I can't tell you how to do that universally for all opportunities there's not a there's just not one way to do it but there is an answer for every opportunity and it's it's managing the process of getting to the answer that is the is the real skill um, and requires some experience so check this element off if your firm uses explicit criteria to add subcontractors and uses a theory of the team be interesting to get some feedback from um, each of you to see how you did on each one of the um, um, sections that I'm talking about. Okay, 
I think there's one or two more that I cover, one or two more of the elements. So Mallory, let's look at the next one. Oh, proposal readiness. Yeah, I love this one too. Okay, so I, <clears throat> I do a lot of work on proposal development. I love to sit in on red teams. Um, and I, I like to use a technique to determine if the proposal team is really ready to go or not. Um, you know, the, the thought of think, plan, do, rather than pick up your pencil and start to write before you actually understand what it is um, you're trying to accomplish with the proposal is just so true. So maybe it took nine months and you've done all of that work on the capture. You followed all of the 11 precepts. You've gotten the competitive information. You have a coach. Um, you've, you've, you've answered all of the competitive questions so you know you're on the playing field. You know the client prefers you. You've tilted the playing field in your direction, so you must be you must have this in the bag. You should be a shoe in to win, break out the champagne, and then you lost. Why? Very often it's because marketing resources effectively and deftly position to win lose because the team is not fully prepared to begin the proposal effort. It takes both positioning with the client, which is the capture part, and competitors, and readiness to write the proposal to be the successful bidder. Positioning means understanding under the blue on the right, competitive landscape, client preferences, special differentiators, teaming theory, all of those questions need to be answered. Readiness are things like storyboarding, the management plan, resumes, project descriptions, subs, uh, packages, etc. Everything that could be done well before the RFP comes out so you're not struggling to do all of those things when the RFP hits. You've already got all of that back office stuff done and you can spend time on the creative part of writing the proposal. But how can you be sure you don't waste a great marketing effort on a, on a poor proposal? I found that by far the number one test is to have the proposal manager draft an executive summary several weeks before the RFP is due out, even if it won't likely be used in the bid. If the proposal manager can't tell a compelling story before the RFP is issued, why would anyone think he or she can do that in the proposal? A poor initial executive draft is a big red flag that the proposal leader and probably the proposal team is not sufficiently prepared to even start the effort. You want to know that before the RFP is issued when you can take steps to get ready rather than after the proposal effort has started when it may be too late. So if you're following along and checking off boxes, check element nine on the checklist if your company tests the proposal team before launching the proposal. Okay, I think the next one is the last one about red teams. getting high scores in internal proposals, something most uh, proposal teams don't take very seriously. Terrible red teams, terrible red team versions are just, I would have to say the worst thing you can do as a proposal manager. Poorly prepared drafts for internal reviews, red teams have a series of potentially serious reper repercussions that will hamstring growth. They waste the time, I'm reading off from the left, they waste the time of expensive senior reviewers. That's just horrible to sit in a red team and they didn't really do the job. Miss the chance for serious critiques, the feedback won't be there, and leave the proposal team scrambling to recover rather than adding creativity to the bid. And it's not that hard to fix this. Moreover, everyone involved in the red team is having a negative experience. Have you guys been there? which hurts company morale and is embarrassing if subcontractors are participating. Firms that always get off to bad proposal starts just can't win consistently because government contracting is much too competitive for weak efforts to prevail. Moving to the right, insist that each red team chapter scores 80%, and it's important to actually score each chapter. Even if you don't know the evaluation, criteria explicitly, you can come up with a set that are going to be close enough based on past RFPs or just basic experience. And the reviewers can, re provide, can focus on providing important guidance if, if every chapter scores 
than wasting their time struggling with a non-compliant, difficult to understand and score document. In the final days of the proposal, the writers will be working on polishing a good draft rather than panicking to get a poor one merely into compliance in time for submission. When I moved from SAIC to Vire and Company, where I was a partner, I ran half of the company. And the first proposal we did, I wrote one chapter myself for um, a bid that we were going after. We happened to win it, but not because the proposal was well done. Um, but I took on the role of writing one of the chapters and we scored very well in my chapter because I knew I had to get it done in time for the red team to score high and the rest of the folks didn't. But it was very good guidance um, for the team to see that um, they had to they had to deliver on time. They had to deliver on time. It takes just as long to write the chapter the last week as it does two or three weeks before. It doesn't take any more time. So you might as well do it early when you can actually turn in a good draft. Uh, rather than do it late in the proposal effort. Do it early in the red team will be a positive experience for everyone involved. Setting a high red team bar will lower proposal costs because you may not have to do the red team again, uh, which happens very often. You know, sometimes uh, I like to joke, we, we, we didn't have that the team, the red team, the, the proposal team didn't have time to do it right. They did have time to do it over though, and that's very expensive. So check Item 10, element 10, if your company exists on minimum scores in internal reviews. Last slide, Mallory. So here's the checklist again. Just to refresh, remember we went over, let's see, we went over bid decision framework. Let's see, I think we did. We did bid decision framework? No, we did. Um, we did teaming. We did proposal readiness, we did red team scores, and we did one other. And now I can't remember because I did this so often. But, but uh, take a look at that, and you can see that the way I describe these just gives you some clues as to how to simplify the, your, your over total, the, each element of your, um, of your capture and your pipeline management program. If you focus on these 11 items um, and you do them really well, you can't help but grow your company. So Mallory, that's the last slide, and um, I finished in 20 minutes. Thank you so much, Ed, for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Uh, today's presentation has been recorded, um, and it will be on our website or YouTube channel within about 48 hours. If you have questions for Ed, uh, email him directly with the phone number or email shown on your screen. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank you very much, Mallory.